p.m. And we are going to get started here. Thank you to all of you for being here today. We have some folks that are just joining us for breaking into bird watching with Miles and Teresa Tuffley. Um, this series, this is part two of Birding to Beat the Winter Blues, which is a series that we are offering here at the Laguna Foundation in partnership with the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors Community Investment Program. So thank you to them for supporting our work and supporting this program. My name is Allison Titus, and I am the Community Education Manager here at the Laguna Foundation. If you just joined us, please feel free to say hello in the chat box, tell us where you are located, and perhaps a bird noticing, which is a term we learned from our first event in the series with Jenny O'Dell. Um, tell us an encounter or an experience you've had with birds recently. Um, it's fun to all get to share and see our responses. So let's see here. Oops, I skipped a slide. So this is the second event in Birding to Beat the Winter Blues. We have two more events in the series that are coming up early next month. Um, the next one is next week on February 4th. And Irma Cuevas and I from Sonoma County Regional Parks will tag team a bilingual program all about bird migration. All of the information will be shared in both English and Spanish. So if you're hesitant or interested, wanna to go to the whole series, but you're not sure because you don't speak Spanish, no worries, we'll be sharing in both languages. Um, so you might learn some new vocabulary in addition to learning a lot about bird migration. Um, we will be talking a little bit about how, why, and where birds migrate and some highlights of birds that migrate to the Laguna and other parts of Sonoma County. After learning about bird migration and how it works, we will learn about the waterfowl of the Pacific Flyway with local naturalist Dave Barry on February 11th. So I hope you join us for another one of these events in the series. Thank you to those of you who have come to the first two events already. We really appreciate your support. And all of these events will be recorded and sent to registrants. So again, Thank you all for attending this program. We may have had some people just join. Please feel free to say hello. I am going to introduce the Laguna Foundation and give you some housekeeping notes to get started before I introduce our wonderful speakers here with us today. The Laguna Foundation is a nonprofit organization based in Santa Rosa that works to restore, conserve, and inspire public appreciation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa wetlands. There are a lot of ways to describe the Laguna and our work. The Laguna is a wetland, first and foremost, as you can see in this picture up in the top right. But it is also a 22 mile long waterway here in Sonoma County, as well as an entire watershed. If you live in Katati, Rohnert Park, Santa Rosa, Windsor, or parts of Sebastopol, you live within the Laguna watershed. And the Laguna de Santa Rosa faces important issues that drive the work that we do at the Laguna Foundation. In more modern times, it has gone from being described as devoid of life in the 1970s to, now, to being designated as a wetland of international importance in 2011, which was 10 years ago. So we are celebrating that anniversary this year. And it was designated as a wetland of international importance because of the incredible biodiversity that is found here. You can see some of that here with our endangered Sebastopol meadow foam, the bald eagles that returned to the Laguna in the last few years. And of course, there is a lot of bird diversity. These are some of Miles and Teresa's photos. Um, and this is some of the bird diversity we have here in the Laguna. Feel free to drop some names in here if you know them or things you notice about these birds. Um, we've got here a yellow rumped warbler, a really great photo of a great blue heron that looks, it just looks like a dinosaur. <laughs> and then we've got Northern Flicker here in the middle, yes. 
a white-tailed kite, which someone mentioned in the chat, they see regularly at the Laguna. Yes, the Laguna, the Laguna is a great place to see this bird. And then cedar waxwing, yes, which is always a treat to see these birds. Um, I actually have them in my neighborhood pretty often. So even with the designation, even with this biodiversity that we see in the Laguna, there is still a lot of work to be done. And that is where we come in as the Laguna Foundation. The Laguna still has poor water quality and high amounts of introduced species that threaten the, bi the biodiversity that we do see. There's impacts from wildfires on the outskirts of the watershed. And many people don't know why the Laguna is so important or even where it is. So even though it sustains lots of people in addition to all of these plants and animals, we are the only organization that is dedicated specifically to conserving this watershed and working to restore that wetland habitat, preserve that biodiversity, manage the introduced species, and improve the water quality, along with educating and inspiring future generations so that the Laguna is a place for all to enjoy and protect for years to come. And you are a part of that by being here today, so thank you. And I just want to give you a couple Zoom notes for this experience specifically. I know probably many of you have spent a lot of time on Zoom. You probably got this spiel earlier this week. But here's what I'd recommend for this webinar. Please add your questions and say hello in the chat box. Share nature notes, whatever you'd like. Um, you can hover your mouse over the bottom of the Zoom screen if you're on a computer and the option to select the chat box should pop up. So click on that chat box icon and say hi if you haven't already. And next level Zoom tip, where you see that type your message here option, right above that there is a little box that says two and then there's a gray box that says all panelists and attendees or all panelists. You can use that drop down to address your no, you know, what you want to say. If it's all panelists and attendees, then everyone can see your comment. If it's just all panelists, it will just be to myself or Miles and Teresa. So please feel free to mess with that. We will hopefully have some time at the end of the presentation for questions from the audience. And we can follow up unanswered questions in an email after the program. And the last thing is, Please be patient with us and the technology today. You know, we're always navigating this during this time and the weather this week has kind of added to the ever present tech challenges of today. So if you experience any delays, please just be patient and we will navigate that as best as possible. Know that we will get up and running as quickly as we can and we appreciate your patience. So I think that is it for housekeeping notes at this time. I am so thrilled to have Miles and Teresa back to give this presentation. They actually gave this presentation at the Laguna Foundation in our event space, which is called Heron Hall, just about a little less than a year ago. And it was our last presentation that we had before the community education program went entirely online. Um, due to COVID, so it's an interesting marker of time. Um, and during that presentation, even as someone who watches birds regularly, I learned so much from this presentation. And I'm sure I will learn something new again, seeing it for the second time. Teresa and Miles are avid birders from Guerneville who especially love helping bird curious folks take the next step of, um, adventuring and into the field and getting to enjoy the bird world. They lead guided bird walks and give presentations for all kinds of local organizations here in Sonoma County and Marin County as well. As you saw in this introduction, Miles and Teresa also enjoy documenting our local birds through photography and in writing, and you can follow their work at their website and blog. I'm birding right now, and I will drop that link in the chat in a minute. Um, Miles and Teresa, thank you so much for being here today. And I am so excited to hear your presentation. Thank you so much, Allison. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you to the Laguna Foundation for including us in this wonderful birding series. And 
Are we still on? You're, I can see you, you're okay. just frozen, but. Okay. Okay, I think we, are we back now? Yep. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I think there's a little delay when it transitions from the share screen. So um, I'll start over. Hey, everybody, I'm Teresa. I'm Miles, nice to see you. <laughs> and thank you so much, Allison. And thank you to Laguna Foundation for having us as part of this wonderful uh, Birding to Beat the Winter Blues series. We're super excited to be here today. And it has been a, a wild year since we last presented this at Heron Hall, but we're so excited to be able to do it again today um, over Zoom. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and start sharing um, our screen and everybody bear with us just for maybe 30 seconds. It, it, it can be a little bit slow when we do that. And um, once I start sharing our screen and we start the actual presentation, we're just going to cut our video out until the end. So one second, here we go. I think we're coming up here. Okay, can you see that? Okay, great. Um, then I'm going to stop our video and we'll get started. One second. Okay. Make sure you can click through. One sec. Okay. Um, can everybody hear us? Okay. So, um, we are here with Breaking into Bird Watching. So, thank you again for joining us. So a little bit about ourselves, Allison, thank you so much for introducing us. But once again, we're Miles and Teresa Tuffley. We give guided bird walks and teach beginners birding classes here in Sonoma County and down in Marin counties. We have a website called I'm Birding Right Now, where we document a lot of our local birds here in the Bay Area. Um, and I would think it's safe to say that Teresa and I are both quite obsessed with birds. Uh, we fell in love with not only the birds themselves, which certainly provide, you know, endless amounts of awe and wonder in our life, but actually the physical and mental act of going out bird watching really, really um, kind of hooked us right from the start with just how amazing it made us feel while we were doing it and even afterwards. Uh, you know, first off, it gets us outside, which is really important and we love, but it really encourages us to slow down and really engage our senses in the natural world. Um, which has just a number of wonderful benefits. Um, and we really appreciate how it keeps us grounded in the moment. So really after even the very first time we went out bird watching, we realized how amazing it made us feel and we just kind of kept coming back day after day and really just haven't stopped since. Yeah, and we also uh, discovered along the way that we really enjoy uh, introducing people to the wonderful world of birds. So we kind of put this presentation together with that in mind, uh, thinking about when we first started looking at birds, um, just trying to put together a, a primer of some birding basics of things that might be nice to know towards the beginning. So let's uh, take a quick look. This is our agenda for the presentation. Um, and we are going to try to pack quite a lot into it. And uh, this is being recorded. So uh, if we're going too fast through some of the slides, uh, our apologies, but it will be recorded and you can go back and review it. And uh, we will try to leave a little bit of time at the end for some Q&A. Uh, so go ahead and keep putting those questions in the chat box. And I wanted to just point out that uh, the photographs in our slideshow are uh, photos that we've taken here in the Bay Area, mostly all in Sonoma County, of birds that we can see here. And we've taken the time to label each one so you know just what you're looking at. Okay, so uh, first things first. We're here to uh, hopefully start looking at birds. So how exactly do we go about looking for birds? 
All right, so first some nuts and bolts um, with binocular usage. We often get asked, you know, what do these numbers mean here? What is this eight by 42? So eight uh, just refers to the magnification. That's just how close up the bird is gonna look through your binoculars. The 42 is the measurement of the lens diameter on the other side of the binoculars in millimeters. And this just corresponds to the amount of light that is being let in to your binoculars. So how bright the image. So the bigger this number, the, the more bright your image is gonna be, but also the bigger your binoculars are gonna be. So um, there's kind of a trade off there. So kind of the general consensus is that eight by 42 binoculars are the best for general bird watching. They give you a nice bright image and the birds are nice and close, but you can also wear them around your neck for you know, hours at a time without it hurting too much. <laughs> uh, eight by 32 is a smaller alternative that works really well. And as far as buying a pair of binoculars, you know, there's a really wide range of prices. You can, you know, get a $50 pair of binoculars all the way up to a couple thousand dollars. Um, there's no need to spend that much money. We feel like the most bang for your buck um, is kind of in the $125 to $400 range. This will get you a, a pair of quality binoculars that should last you a lifetime, um, but give you a nice bright image. Uh, you can also look for a used pair to knock some of the, the money down a little bit. Teresa and I both uh, bought our binoculars uh, off of eBay for used and they're working great. Uh, one thing I did want to mention is the eye cups here. So I don't know if you can see my uh, mouse arrow. So the eye cups here, um, most binoculars will allow for adjustment on these eye cups and they will just, if you twist them, they'll just roll up or roll back down. And this is adjusting what is called the eye relief. And the eye relief is just the distance between your pupil and that lens there. And what you're trying to do is get the widest field of vision, um, just one clear circle. So if you're not wearing glasses, start with the eye cups rolled up and away from the lens. If you are wearing glasses, roll them down and just play around with the setting until you're getting the, the biggest field of vision with your binoculars. And if you are pretty new to using binoculars, uh, keep in mind that there, there is definitely a learning curve with it. And um, you're gonna wanna start practicing on fixed spots. You know, Don't even worry about birds to begin with. Just pick a signpost in the distance or a, a particular leaf on a tree. And um, it might sound kind of overly simple, but really the best tip that we can give for using binoculars is you know, once you've used your naked eye to identify what your target is, keep your head looking straight at that target. Um, keep your gaze steady on it. And remember, don't look down at your binoculars to grab them. So as you are continuing to look straight ahead at the target, bring your binoculars up to your eyes without moving your head. And that's gonna give you the best opportunity to have that uh, target object in your field of vision or, or hopefully a little bit close by. But if you don't see what you're trying to look at right away, you know, bring the binoculars down and sort of refocus again with your head and your naked eye and try again until this becomes more natural and you get a little better at getting on your target right away. Uh, you know, you can see in this picture here, this American pipit is blending in super well to the grass. So if you are looking at it in your binoculars and then you lose sight of it, it's always a good idea to use your naked eye to refine that bird because it's a lot easier to, to spot that movement when you're looking at a wider field of vision. And you know, before too long, you'll be getting on that red-tailed hawk in the sky that's moving around no problem. So it might sound counterintuitive, but uh, the best way to notice birds is probably to use your ears first. So birds make um, a variety of vocalizations all, all year round. It's not just when they're singing songs during spring. There's a variety of that birds will vocalize um, in the middle of winter. And if you really tune your ears in and just make, make it a, a habit to try to notice the bird vocalizations in your um, what, with what you can hear as you go about your day, you're going to notice a lot more birds. Um, but it's not only vocalizations. Birds make a, uh, a variety of sounds just moving through their environment, whether it's their wings flapping overhead or them rustling in the bushes or hopping through the trees, banging against leaves or scratching in the dried leaf litter. Uh, so we have this picture of a fox sparrow, this cute little fox sparrow who has a funny foraging technique of a lot of sparrows called double scratching. And that's where they just use both their legs and they, they kind of hop 
and scratch the leaf litter back underneath them to remove that first layer to see what's underneath for food. But it's amazing how much sound this can make when you really tune your ears into it. So we actually have a, a recording that we recorded of a fox sparrow doing this. You can hear some um, actual vocalizations, but listen to how loud the, the double scratching technique is on the leaves. When you tune your ears into not only the vocalizations, but the sounds of them moving through their environment, you'll start noticing a lot more birds. And uh, of course, I think we're all here today out of an appreciation for birds. So I just want to remind everyone to try and disturb the bird life as little as possible. Of course, if you are at um, a regional park, say, and you're walking down the trail, uh, birds are definitely going to get out of your way and there's, there's no avoiding that. But you can uh, minimize your disturbance to the birds by moving quietly and very slowly, especially when you're actively looking for the birds. And it's really helpful and important to notice how a bird is responding to you. So say that you're looking at a sparrow on the ground and you move a couple steps towards it and it flies away from you into a bush. And so, you know, you wanna get a little bit closer and get a better look. So you walk a couple more steps forward and then suddenly it flies farther away into a tree. That is, uh, that, that, that is termed flushing. So you're essentially flushing the bird away. And that's essentially the bird telling you that you're getting a little bit too close to it for comfort. And the best thing to do in those scenarios is to back away and give the bird a little bit of space, you know, let it become accustomed to your presence. And just by being still and quiet, you often will get that look at the bird that you're, you're hoping to see. And here we have a photograph of a Cooper's hawk nest with some very, very cute young chicks in it. And um, I don't know about you, but I love baby birds, that's for sure. Uh, but I want to point out that it's really important to be extra careful with nesting birds because, um, you know, the parents and the baby birds are at a very vulnerable time in their life. Uh, they are extra vulnerable to predators. So just keep your distance, you know, don't definitely don't approach a nest with a bird sitting on it. And, you know, don't linger too long around where a nest is and just, just give it distance and space. Okay, so now let's move on to when to look for birds. The short answer here is all the time, anytime. Uh, we really want to hammer home that when you make looking for birds or trying to notice birds a habit, it's amazing how many more you will see uh, throughout your day. That said, there are some things to consider when trying to kind of get the most bang for your buck. Um, dawn and dusk are particular times of the day where there's an uptick in bird activity. Uh, we definitely want to be clear, you can see birds all throughout the day, even at you know, high noon on a hot day, you're still going to see some birds out. But there is an uptick in activity um, come morning when um, after a good night's sleep, the birds wake up and they're hungry. So they're going to go forage. So there's going to be an uptick of, of foraging activity. And the same thing happens at the end of the day when the birds are trying to get their kind of last meals in. Um, a particularly wonderful experience is the dawn chorus, which happens during the spring months. And that is just when all the birds are waking up and they all start singing their songs on top of each other. And it's just this wonderful symphony of bird sounds. Um, we really um, would suggest that you, you try to wake up early and experience that during the spring. Uh, birds also, uh, when they go roost for the night, and roost just means the place that they're going to go sleep, uh, several bird species sleep in communal roosts. And so as dusk approaches, you can sometimes see, particularly during the winter months, you can sometimes see like hundreds of American robins or hundreds or thousands of red-winged blackbirds flying overhead on their way to the communal roosts, uh, which is just a really fun experience. And we do want to point out that uh, weather can play a, a part in the amount of bird activity that you will see, particularly um, in bouts of either extreme temperatures, you know, on a super hot day or on a morning where it's still really frosty outside and it's below freezing. Uh, there's going to be a little bit less bird activity. Same thing with a really windy day. So you can imagine this, this small 
song sparrow and other songbirds that are quite small might have some trouble flying around in a, a windstorm or on a particularly breezy day. So they might have a tendency to sort of tuck away and wait that out. And um, on rainy days, you know, if it is raining all day long, sure, you're definitely going to see birds out and about at some point because, you know, they, they have to eat. But pay attention in particular to breaks in the rain. So if it suddenly stops raining and the sun comes out and starts shining, that is a really, really great time to look for birds because a lot of those little songbirds that have been tucked away are suddenly going to come out all at once to get a quick bite in. And uh, this photograph is of a song sparrow, like I mentioned, and it looks like this song sparrow may have taken a moment uh, during a break in the rain to come out and sit on this wire and start maybe drying off. It's, it's got its wings spread a little bit and it's looking rather soggy. Soggy song sparrow. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how time of year affects bird watching. And one of the great things about bird watching as an activity or a hobby for us bird watchers is how dynamic it is. The, you know, the bird's behavior, where you'll find them, even what they look like, all changes on a season to season, sometimes just a month to month basis, which makes it really exciting. Um, but I did want to talk about a concept called bird distribution, which is just where a bird, a particular bird is expected to be found um, at any time of the year in the world. So um, there's four different categories of birds in as far as bird distribution goes. And so here in the Bay Area, here are some examples. So the red-tailed hawk up here is a, an example of a bird that is a resident here. So it's found all 12 months year round red-tailed hawk. Now the black-headed grosbeak is only found here during the breeding months, so springs and summer. And it spends its winters down in Mexico and will head up, yeah, head up here to uh, raise a new, a new brood during the spring and summer months before heading back down to Mexico during the winter. And then on the other hand, we have birds like the ruby-crowned kinglet who just spend their winters down here. So they breed up in the northern latitudes or the higher altitudes. And then once the food gets scarce there in the winter months, they come on down here to spend their time. A, a special example of a case of birds that only show up here during migration. So during their spring or fall migration between their breeding ground, winter grounds, they will stop over forage, kind of fatten up, gain some more energy before heading along their migration route. And this is the case for many shorebirds, including this red-necked phalarope, who you can see once in a while down in Bodega Bay. Another way in which the time of year matters is that um, not all species, but some species do look different during different times of the year. And uh, this shorebird here, the dunlin, is a great example of that. So on the left, we have a dunlin as you would typically see it in the Bay Area over winter time. It's just very, you know, drab. It's uh, dark gray on its head and its back, and then just a bright white on the belly. And that's about it. But come springtime, the dunlin starts uh, transitioning into its breeding plumage. And you can see it grows this really bold black patch on its belly and these beautiful reddish orange feathers on the back and on top of the head. And you can see how it is uh, more bright and sort of lively and attractive. And if you were to see these two photographs and not know what this bird was, you might think you're looking at two different species, but um, it's just a good reminder to always be aware that a bird could look different at different times of the year. So if you're looking at something unfamiliar, um, be aware of that when you're starting to search in your field guide or online for trying to identify something. Okay, so let's move on to where to look for birds. And just like for when to look for birds is all the time, where to look for birds is anywhere. So we like to say here, there, and everywhere is a good place to try to notice birds. So keep an open mind. Even parking lots can provide really wonderful bird observations. So here is a photo of Teresa. We had just pulled into the Sevastopol Community Center, and we we're going to go walk over to the Laguna, but a flock of cedar waxwings flew right into the tree, uh, right smack in the middle of the parking lot, provided a wonderful um, observation for us. 
I know here in Guerneville, even in the Safeway parking lot, we've seen red-breasted sapsuckers in the trees or a bald eagle flying overhead. So just keep an open mind, make looking a habit, and you'll notice birds in the darndest places sometimes. A pretty important concept for uh, knowing uh, where to look for birds is the idea of an edge habitat. And so quite simply, the edge habitat is where two different habitats converge. And habitats are important in terms of birds because different species uh, prefer different habitats. You know, they are looking for a particular type of habitat that offers them the appropriate food that they need or the appropriate coverage that they need to, to be able to hide. And so it just kind of follows that if you're someplace where you're looking at two different habitats, you will, uh, as a bird watcher, have the opportunity to see a higher variety and number of species in one spot. And it can also help with uh, visibility as far as bird watching goes. You know, can, you can see here the edge habitat created by the edge of a pond meeting the reeds. And these black crowned night herons are sitting out in the open, uh, catching a little bit of morning sun right here at the edge. Whereas sometimes they're just tucked away in the middle of the reeds and you wouldn't even know that they're there. So that's another reason it can be helpful. Water can often create that nice edge habitat, you know, whether it's the uh, shoreline or the riverbank. That's always a, a good thing to note. And sometimes even a road cutting through a habitat can create enough of a break to uh, maybe find something a little bit different. So when in doubt on where to go look for birds, just head to the water. Um, like all animals, of course, birds need water to survive for drinking and bathing, like this adorable American robin bathing in the creek. Um, as Teresa just mentioned, water often creates really wonderful edge habitats, which are great for the birds and the bird watcher alike. And furthermore, water is also crucial for the availability of vegetation and food that the birds rely on. So there are a variety of water created habitats that are great for seeing birds like wetlands, rivers, beaches, ponds, and rocky shorelines. So each of these habitats differ in what exactly they have to offer. So you'll find a different, different mixes of species in each of these spots. And particularly uh, here in, in the Greater Bay Area, we are very, very lucky to have an abundance of parks and open spaces to uh, look for birds in. And we just wanted to list out a few of our favorite spots here in Sonoma County. Uh, of course, there's the Laguna de Santa Rosa. And uh, Bodega Bay is a really great place for bird watching any time of the year, but particularly in wintertime, you have the opportunity to see a lot of duck species and loons and grebes and lots of other water related species. Then Ellis Creek in Petaluma is a water treatment plant that has some really nice walking trails around. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with how water treatment plants are, are involved with, um, with bird watching, then uh, don't be turned off by the fact that it's a water treatment plant. It's, it's really more of sort of a, a man-made wetlands with the finishing ponds that they have there. And uh, Ellis Creek is a fantastic place. There, there's just a really, really high variety of birds that you could see there. And Spring Lake in Santa Rosa also is a wonderful place. And then uh, Regal Ranch is one of our personal favorites in Sebastopol. It's a really nice oak woodland habitat. So, you know, if you like things like acorn woodpeckers, that's, that's your spot. And I wanted to point out that one thing that uh, many of these places have in common is that they do feature water. Okay, so now we're gonna move into kind of the, the meat of the presentation on how to look at birds through the lens of trying to identify them down to species. I know when we were first starting uh, getting interested in bird watching, an unfamiliar bird would pop up and we would, uh, you know, be overwhelmed with what to look at in order to identify it. So, you know, we first off try to get it in our binoculars and, and then there'd be so many different things to look at and it'd fly away after five or 10 seconds. And we were trying to look at everything at once. And so we ended up often not really noticing anything very helpful. So we're gonna to try to give you a bit of a systematic approach on how to look at an unfamiliar bird in order to try to narrow it down to maybe at least a family of birds or hopefully a, an actual individual species. A really great place to start is to notice the bill of the bird. So Miles started to mention bird family.
species. And uh, bird species are grouped within larger groupings of bird families. And often the species within a family share a variety of characteristics and bill shape and type is often one of those shared characteristics. So you're gonna to wanna to notice everything you can about the bill. You know, the size of it, the shape, the color, any other details, uh, size specifically, you know, if there are other birds around, sometimes that's a nice thing to compare the bill size to. But if you're just looking at a single bird in isolation, you can always uh, measure the bill size compared to the, the head of the bird itself. You know, is it about the same length as the head or is it a lot, lot shorter or is it longer than the head? And then once you can kind of start identifying the different types of bills, you'll notice that it often will indicate what kind of food the bird eats. And then that in turn can kind of help give you an idea of where that bird might be found or what kind of habitat or vegetation that it likes to be in. So there's a lot of information that can be gleaned from the bill. So let's just uh, look at a few examples. So right here on the left, we're gonna start with the California towhee, which although it doesn't have sparrow in the name, it is a member of the sparrow family and its bill is uh, quite sparrow-like. So what I'm seeing is that it's Kind of shaped like a triangle and it's pretty chunky and when I say chunky um, I'm, I'm kind of looking right here at where the bill meets the face and it's pretty wide and this type of a sparrow bill uh, is really good for cracking seeds and that's kind of why you see many sparrows on the ground they're they're hunting around for seeds that have fallen off the trees or the vegetation onto the ground so contrast that with this really cute Wilson's warbler uh, warblers as a group in general are most often found flitting around the trees and in vegetation. Uh, they are often looking for really, really small bits of food. So tiny insects or little spider eggs, things like that. And so you can see that their bill is very small in a corresponding fashion. Uh, I kind of like to think of this small sort of skinny, tiny bill as like a tiny pair of tweezers used to grab things. And then contrast that with woodpecker bills. So this is our, our largest woodpecker here in the North America, the pileated woodpecker. And in general, woodpeckers have these uh, sort of stout, sturdy, chisel-like bills, and they are designed for uh, pecking and drilling holes into the barks of trees. And once they've drilled a hole, they'll stick that long bill in and then use their unusually long tongue to feel around for beetles and other types of food. And then lastly, on the right, we have one of our shorebirds called the marbled godwit. And when I say shorebird, that's actually not technically a family. It's a much larger grouping of birds. Uh, there are multiple families within the shorebird category. But in general, most shorebirds um, have a, a you know, a bill that is designed to be put directly into the sand. So they stick that bill into the sand and probe around for little invertebrates to eat. And in fact, on this picture here, you can see that uh, the Godwit's bill is covered in sand. So once you start to learn more about bills and bill types, you can start to see how form really fits function. So the next thing you're going to want to notice is the size of the bird. And that's pretty intuitive when an unfamiliar bird pops up. You're going to, you're going to notice about how big it is. But one helpful tip uh, we like to give is to use benchmark birds that you're already familiar with. So when you see an unfamiliar bird pop up, try to visualize it somewhere on the spectrum of your familiar benchmark birds. Uh, we do want to say that size can be difficult to judge uh, at a distance or in isolation or particularly if the bird is flying there's not really much to judge it against um, but if you can judge it against something that is helpful it doesn't even have to be a bird so it can be you know just any object you know a fence post how big is it compared to the fence post that it's sitting on or the thickness of the branch that that, that it's perched on or even the leaf in the tree to compare it to and then shape can be a really, really helpful ID clue as well. Uh, when we try to assess the shape of a bird out in the field, uh, we like to imagine it in silhouette because it helps us focus on the proportions instead of getting distracted by the color or the patterns. So let's take a look at this particular silhouetted bird. 
Some things that I'm seeing are that it has a quite a compact sort of bulky body. I'm not really seeing much of a definition on the neck area. And then I see that the body goes almost all the way down to its feet, which is giving me the impression of short legs. And then the head, uh, I know that a lot of birds often show a pretty round head on top, but I'm noticing that this bird's head kind of goes up and slopes up to a bit of a point or what we call a peak. And then uh, I want to look at the bill, of course, and I'm noticing that lengthwise compared to the head, it's not very big. And um, where it meets the face here, it's not, it doesn't seem very tall or, or wide, depending on how, how you want to label it. So I'm going to call this a pretty thin bill. So let's go ahead and fill in the color. And what we have is a black Phoebe, which is one of Sonoma County's uh, flycatchers. It's a member of the flycatcher family. And one great thing to know about flycatchers is that not every single one, but many flycatchers actually show this style of peaked head. So if you had noticed that and didn't know what this bird was, that could have been a really great helpful ID clue. Okay, so let's move on to field marks. And a field mark is simply a visible mark that you can see while you're out bird watching that helps you identify a bird in the field. So um, there, when you're starting to learn how to identify birds, you're gonna start hearing uh, a lot of terminology in relation to, to field marks, when, particularly when you're looking in a field guide or online. So we just wanted to introduce you to some, some of these terminology by no means exhaustive, but some ones that you'll uh, run across quite often are examples like wing bars, streaking, which are just vertical lines on a bird, barring, which are horizontal lines, spotting and striping, and then of course overall colors or patches are going to be very important when uh, trying to look at what the field marks are. So here we have a beautiful northern flicker, which is a woodpecker, and it, the northern flicker just looks like it fell out of the field mark tree and hit every branch on the way down. It's just littered with field marks, color patches, spotting, um, uh, barring here on the back, uh, just a really beautiful bird. But let's look at some other examples of field marks on different common birds. So here on the left, we have a song sparrow, and this is a great example of streaking on a bird. So these kind of horizontal markings across the breast, I'm sorry, vertical markings across the breast. And just in general, the song sparrow is very streaky. We have streaks on the back and down the wings. And in sparrows in general, if you can get a look at the front of the bird, the breast of the bird, try to notice if there's any markings at all, if there's any streakings or if it's just plain. Now, the great horned owl is a great example of horizontal barring here all across the belly. The red-breasted sapsucker just shows a wonderful kind of color blocking. So this really bright red head and breast contrast really sharply with the black back. And then this white wing patch here is really conspicuous. And that happens to be a feature shared on many sapsuckers. So noticing where the color patches are on the bird is also very important. So here on the right, we have a Pacific Slope flycatcher. Whoops. And this is just a great example of wing bars. So wing bars are just horizontal lines that go across the wing. And most often they're of a lighter color than the rest of the wings. And I did also want to point out on this Pacific Slope flycatcher, Teresa mentioned the shape of the head and flycatchers. And we can see that there is a bit of a peak on the top of the head before it drops off here, um, like many flycatchers show. And the head and face of a bird is a particularly good spot to look for field marks. And there are another whole host of field marks that are commonly found on the head and face that are shared across totally different unrelated species. So things like eye rings and eyebrows and eye lines and head striping and even eye color as well. So this uh, beautiful white crown sparrow is showing a really great example of just bold black and white stripes on the head. Some other examples we have, the blue gray gnat catcher. So this is in what's called an eye ring. It's just a, a line of feathers around the eye that's different from the rest of the feathers on the face. Then the Buick's wren, um, this is what's called an eyebrow. And simply it is a line of different colored feathers uh, right above the eye. 
And that is contrasted with what is called an eye stripe, which is essentially a stripe that goes directly to the center of the eye. And sometimes it will be just behind the eye, like right here. And sometimes it'll be in front of the eye right here from the eye to the bill. And sometimes like on this really cute mallard duckling, it goes um, both in front and, and behind the eye. So it kind of creates this stripe through the eye. And then of course, on the right side, this spotted toey is showing this beautiful devilishly red eye. And that is a really great uh, ID clue for the spotted toey in particular. Okay, so after you've noticed the bill, the size and the shape of the bird and taken account of all the field marks, um, take a step back and notice the big picture. Ask yourself some questions like, where is the bird and what is it doing in the habitat? Um, is it just perched still and just looking around? Or is it moving around? And if it is moving, how is it moving? Is it moving really quickly flittering through the trees or is it kind of more methodical on the ground or on the trunk of the tree? And then uh, take a look at the posture. Is the bird more horizontal or is it kind of you know, standing upright with its head you know, well above its tail? And then another great question is, is it alone or in a flock? So if the bird is in a flock, if there's a bunch of other birds around, take a close look and see if they all look identical or if maybe they don't um, have the identical field marks. Are they all identical size and shape? And this would be considered a same species flock. If all the birds look different, that's what's called a mixed species flock. And these are great clues because some birds um, are almost never found alone. They're almost always found in a same species flock. Um, so let's take a look at these photos here and just see what we can pick up about uh, the habitat behavior and posture. So the Pacific Wren, I'm seeing it's on a mossy stump. So it seems like it's really low to the ground and the posture is really sticking out at me. This bird is, is really horizontal. And I'm also seeing that the tail is sticking up behind its back and above its head. So those are nice clues to keep in mind. Over here, we have the spotted sandpiper. And obviously I'm noticing that it's near water but it's also on a rock rather than on you know, sandy shoreline. So it's on a rocky shoreline, so that's interesting. And when we were watching this bird, there was a really fun behavior we were noticing where it would bob its tail or bob its butt up and down constantly. Its head would be totally still and its butt would just be bobbing up and down. And it turns out that is um, a behavior that the spotted sandpiper shows. So it's really a nice clue to use. Down here, we have the brown creeper. So we have a bird that is, uh, stuck to the side of the trunk and it basically looks like a piece of bark and we were watching this bird and it would just make its way up the trunk sticking its little bill in the crevices of the trunk and at a certain point it would fly back down to the bottom of the, either the same tree or a different tree and start all over again always moving upwards it turns out that is a great behavioral clue for the brown creeper the white-breasted nuthatch, on the other hand, was also stuck to the side of the trunk and would also stick its um, you know, chiseled bill into the, into the bark to see what it could find, but it was mostly moving downwards. So noticing these behaviors can give you some really great extra clues when you're trying to identify a bird. And then lastly, we want to stress the importance of watching birds fly. Um, the flight style of a bird can be a really fantastic clue. And I know that I, I still, to this day, I sometimes am watching a bird hop around a tree and then suddenly it takes off and I just stop watching it. I just, for some reason, have this tendency to go, oh, well, there it goes. But, but watching it when it flies, especially if you've identified what the bird is, then getting a chance to watch that bird fly is just adding more info to your arsenal of, of information about that particular bird. And another thing we wanna point out is um, sometimes uh, watching a bird fly can a field mark that you can't even see when the bird is not flying. So the willet is a shorebird here. That's a great example of that. Uh, on the left, the willet standing, just standing around or moving around is gonna look like an all gray bird, you know, gray head, gray body, gray legs, dark gray bill, and that's about it, that's all you see. But once the bird flies, it has this really, really distinct bold black and white pattern on the wings that is a wonderful ID point for the willet. So just keep your, keep your eyes out for that. And um, also as you get better at using your binoculars, then um, it'll be easier and easier to track that bird when it's flying.
Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about field guides. So, um, you know, essentially a field guide is just a guide to uh, the birds that can be expected in a designated location. So, you know, the one that we use typically is one for all the birds within Western North America. And um, I know that field, field guides can get quite overwhelming, especially if you're just starting out. So uh, I remember being out in the field when we were first starting out and, you know, we saw a yellow bird fly by. And we were just frantically flipping through our field guide trying to find that yellow bird that matched. And I was really, really dismayed to learn that there are hundreds of yellow birds that it could have been. And, and it, you know, it can be really difficult to figure out what you're looking at. So we're just going to try to give you a couple of tips to help you get the most out of using a field guide. And the biggest tip we can give you is just simply to familiarize yourself at home. Uh, don't wait until you're out in the field to be flipping through your field guide. Um, so here we just have two pictures uh, or a photo of two of our favorite field guides. We really like the David Allen Sibley field guides. And the one on the left there is of just the birds in Western North America and it's much smaller. This is the one we keep in the car or take out in the field with us and use it all the time. As you can see, it's well worn. Uh, the guide on the right is for all the birds in North America and this one we keep at home on the coffee table and we just will flip through it, you know, look at birds on the East Coast that we don't get a chance to see and read the family accounts of all the birds um, is a really uh, helpful thing to do. So for instance, we just took this photo of the family account for the family of wrens here and just look at how much information is just in this um, red box here, I'll, I'll read it. So wrens are mostly small, brown and active, but secretive. They creep through tangled and dense vegetation, foraging for insects and fruit, often with their tails raised above their backs. So it barely mentions what the bird looks like, but it gives us a ton of information about where it's likely to be found, what habitat it likes, what it likes to eat, and then a really cool behavioral clue about how it has its tails raised above their backs. So getting familiar with the family accounts can really help you, you know, start to narrow down um, where to look for in your field guide when you see an unfamiliar bird. And just to nail home uh, how important it is to start learning your bird families, um, this is an example of three birds. So the American Robin, the Hermit Thrush, and the Western Bluebird. And these three birds are all members of the family of thrushes. But if you were to look at these birds just focused on um, color and patterns, you know, they look like three completely unrelated birds. But as we mentioned before, you know, birds within families tend to share certain characteristics and Bill, for example, is, is a good one. So you can see that on each of these birds, uh, they do share a similar type of bill. So it's a rather straight bill and sort of cylindrical. And I like to kind of imagine that this is the end of, uh, you know, the lead in a yellow two, yellow number two pencil that's kind of sticking out at the end there. And over here on the robin, you know, it has its bill open, so it looks a little bigger, but if it were to close its bill, it would look a little more akin to this. And so um, another thing I'm noticing that they share in common is that they have a similar posture. So they each are standing rather upright. You know, you can see that the tail is sort of angled more towards the ground and the head is a little sort of over the feet here. And it gives them this appearance of having kind of a big puffy belly here. And, you know, the more and more you get to learn the different bird families, you know, we're touching upon a handful of bird families in this presentation, but that is definitely not an exhaustive list. There are many bird families. Um, don't get too daunted. You know, there's uh, within North America, I think there are maybe about 70 to 80 bird families, but a lot of those are just one-offs. They just have one species in them, or they're birds that are only found out at sea. So um, it's not that many. It's probably more like 30 to 40 that would be helpful just to kind of familiarize yourself with. 
So another important clue that your field guide will hold is called the range map. And so learning how to read the range map key is really important when you're trying to figure out what bird you're looking at. And this ties into bird distribution. So where a bird is expected to be found in its range at any given time of the year. So let's just go over how to read this range map. So here we have a barn swallow and its corresponding range map. So I'm seeing here that this um, orangish color is for the breeding range of the barn swallow. And here in, in uh, North America, the breeding time of the year is the spring and summer. So this is where the barn swallow is expected to be found during spring and summer. Now on the other side of the spectrum, we have the blue area down here, which is for non-breeding. And that's basically just the winter months um, the barn swallow will be found in, in um, Central America here in Southern Mexico. Now the purple area is where the barn swallow will be found uh, year round, so all 12 months. And then the yellow is where it will be found in the migration. So it doesn't stick around for very long in any of these areas in the yellow, but as it migrates from its breeding grounds to its wintering grounds, it can be found there. And so this is a really important thing to check against when you're seeing an unfamiliar bird. It's not to say that a bird will never be found outside of its range, um, but if it, if, if it doesn't seem to be in its range and you think you're looking at a bird, that would be a rare bird. And um, just gonna have you check, just uh, double check everything a little bit more to make sure you're looking at what you think you're looking at. Okay, and when you're using a field guide, whether it's a field guide book or an online field guide, we really recommend trying to use as many clues as possible to kind of come to decide upon what, what species you think you're looking at. And we're gonna use this photograph of this small flock of birds um, and pretend that this is an unfamiliar species to us and kind of go through step-by-step step on the things that we would try to confirm uh, and the details that we would use as we are flipping through the field guide and trying to confirm if we think we're looking at X species or Y species. So first things first, we wanna look at the bill. And what I'm seeing is a black bill. And if I look at this one, it's about, maybe not quite the length of the head here. It's kind of, you know, it kind of comes down to a little bit narrower of a point as it goes, goes along to the end and size, shape, and posture. So when we were standing here looking at this little flock of birds, I'm gonna guesstimate that they were about the size of an orange or maybe a small grapefruit, um, their bodies at least right here. So I'm seeing this sort of circular spherical body and then a little ice cream scoop head on top. And then posture wise, um, I guess they're a little bit closer to horizontal than vertical. If you see this one in the front, you know, the, the, t the tip of the tail is right here. And then the tip of the bill is here. So that's almost kind of on a horizontal line. Okay, next is field marks. Uh, I see this light gray on the back and the wings and the top of the head. Then I'm seeing a bright white underneath, just all underneath here. I see a black bill, a black eye and black legs. And then on some of these birds, I'm noticing a little bit of black around the edge of the wing right here. Um, this is also sometimes called the shoulder area. Okay, next clue, habitat. So we took this photograph uh, at Bodega Bay on Doran Beach. So we were right next to the beach where the waves were coming up. Um, so we were at the sandy shoreline. And then behavior. So I wish we had a video to show you, uh, but we did notice a behavior right before we took this photograph uh, when the birds were resting. This entire small flock was down at the beach right next to the waves. And um, they were doing this thing where every time a wave would come up and crash on the beach, the whole flock of birds would away from it. And then as soon as the wave receded, they would run towards the receding wave uh, where the water had just been on the beach and they started, you know, dipping their bills into the sand, presumably, I think, to look for food. And then another wave would come up and crash on the beach and they all run away again. So it actually was kind of comical watching this flock. They just kind of were running back and forth, like chasing the waves back and forth on the beach. So maybe that's helpful. Okay, next clue, flight style. Uh, we didn't actually get to see these birds fly, so I'll have to skip that. And then range map is just a good reminder for me to double check 
that this bird is expected in, um, in my area at that time of year if I start to look in the field guide. So, um, so far I'm, I'm kind of guessing that these might be shorebirds, you know, because they're at the sandy shoreline and I watch them stick their bills in the sand. So I'm gonna open up my field guide to the general shorebird area and just start flipping through. It's a, it's a good place to start. And I'm gonna look for something that sticks out that looks like this bird. And I actually find something that looks quite similar. So I'm going to um, start checking other clues to see if I can confirm the ID. So the thing that looks the most similar is the Sanderling. And specifically, this is the picture that caught my eye. So, okay, it's got that gray back and gray head. Uh, it's got the black bill, the black legs, black eye. And then it also even shows this little area of uh, black around the shoulder that I happen to notice. So next step, let us double check some other things. So my field guide is telling me that this is an adult in non-breeding plumage, and that can be expected between September and April. And I took this photo in January, so that checks out, that's great. And next I wanna double check the range map. So I remember that this field guide, um, blue is for winter non-breeding months, and that's what I'm seeing for coastal California. So that checks out too, because it was January. And then I'm gonna start reading the text of the species account and see if there's anything else that seems to fit or maybe not fit specifically for what I saw. And I get to the fine print here, and um, it's kind of small, so maybe I'll read it to you. The first sentence says, common, in non-breeding season, found almost exclusively along sandy beaches with some wave action. Small flocks run rapidly up and down beach, chasing waves and frenetically probing sand for invertebrate prey. By golly, that sounds like I could have written that based on what I saw. So I feel pretty confident, and I'm going to say that I'm pretty sure that I was looking at Sanderlings. All right, so now let's shift into how to listen to birds. Um, bird vocalizations, we really, really enjoy listening to bird vocalizations and trying to identify birds by ear. Um, so this Hutton's Vireo is just belting out its song right here. But let's just talk a little bit about the different types of vocalizations. So first off, bird vocalizations can be separated into two main categories, songs and calls. So songs are sung um, mostly in the breeding months. Some birds will sing year round, but most often it's during spring and summer. And most often it's sung by the male, but um, we're learning that a lot of females actually sing songs as well. But in general, songs are sung to attract a mate and to defend their breeding ter territory from other birds of the same species. Kind of saying like, hey, this is my spot. These, these are all my food sources. You stay away, go find your other spot. So their songs will serve that function. And in general, songs are gonna be longer and more complex uh, than calls are. Now calls on the other hand can be heard year round in the breeding months, but also in the middle of winter, you'll hear a variety of calls. And calls come in a variety of flavors. So we have alarm calls, which are you know when a bird is just alarming at maybe a potential predator to either try to get the predator to leave or to alert um, other birds around that there's danger. Uh, contact calls are often made by birds in pairs or in small flocks or large flocks. And these co contact calls serve the function of just kind of keeping in touch with, with um, each other and saying like, hey, I'm over here foraging and nothing's, nothing's going wrong. There's nothing to worry about. How are you doing over there? So those are contact calls. Flight calls can often be heard in flight, of course, and also right when a bird takes off, they'll often let loose with a flight call. Um, begging calls can be heard during the breeding months, so during spring and summer, not only by the nestlings begging for food, but once the nestlings have fledged their nest and are now out, uh, out of their nest, but still dependent on their parents, you'll hear a lot of begging calls in the summertime. And in general, calls are gonna be shorter and more simple. So let's listen to a couple of examples. Our first example is uh, probably one of our favorite bird songs that we can hear in the area. It's from the black-headed grosbeak, which is a bird that does come here from Mexico to breed in the spring and summer. And um, we just love it because it's sort of the quintessential bird song. It's really musical and rich, and um, it just really lifts our spirits when we hear it. So I'm gonna play this.
So you can hear the complexity of that song and um, we just find it to be so musical with the up and down whistled notes, uh, almost operatic. Um, I'm going to play now a song that is sort of in contrast to that. It's from the Marsh Wren and it is maybe equally complex, but different in quality. So let's just give this a listen. I'm not sure if I would call that musical, but maybe I'd call that a little more mechanical, but still very complex. And on the other hand, um, we're gonna play a couple of call samples. So the first is from an oak titmouse. And just listen, it is a couple of notes uh, repeated over and over again. And we think that this bird was alarming at something. So also listen for the intensity of, of the calls. And then in contrast to that, um, next up is uh, the white-breasted nuthatch. So we actually watched the, the two birds that are in this recording, and it was two white-breasted nuthatches on the same trunk of a tree, about two feet from each other. And they were just making really, really quiet sounds back and forth, um, which made us speculate that they were simply communicating with each other. So listen how different um, these calls are. They're much, much quieter and more delicate. Yeah, not much intensity in, in those sounds. So if you're interested in trying to learn how to identify birds by ear, um, the, our best tip is really just to start simply and to start with a bird you see every day. Um, start with a bird that lives in your yard, whose address is your address. Um, if at all possible, try to watch it vocalize. So if you can link up your auditory and your visual systems um, while you're uh, listening to a bird, it's really helpful to commit it to memory. Once you hear a sound, try to describe the sound to yourself. Ask yourself, you know, how long is it? What is the quality? What's going on with the pitch? Uh, what kind of rhythm is it making? Asking yourself to describe these, um, these qualities is really helpful for, for committing it to memory. So for example, the California towhee is a great bird to start with here in the Bay Area. It's um, a bird that is found in residential areas and often in, in backyards and often will make its sound, make its vocalizations while it's out in the open so you can watch it. So let's take a listen to the California towhee. So if I was going to describe that sound, it was a uh, you know, very short sound. The quality was kind of metallic, kind of sounded like a tink call. Uh, the pitch stayed pretty consistent. It didn't go up or down much. And then the rhythm, it was just a really quick sound and it was repeated, but not in any specific rhythm. It seemed a, a little sporadic. But once you, you know, learn one bird sound, it's, it's amazing how instead of it just feeling like you're just hearing a bird soundscape, all of a sudden you have one sound, one vocalization that you know how to identify, and then the other category of new sounds to you. And then so you just kind of start adding one by one and slowly you'll start building up a nice repertoire of, of bird sounds that you know from your yard. So using mnemonics can be really helpful for bird sounds and mnemonics are just a, a way to associate something to another thing that will help you remember something. So just in the previous slide, you know, Miles called the California Toey's call a metallic tink. And, you know, when we hear that sound, it sounds like it's tinking. And that's, that's just a really simple mnemonic as well. And in the birding community and culture, there are lots of commonly used mnemonics for bird sounds. 
but we also recommend, you know, making up your own. So if you think that something reminds you of something, that will be just as helpful as using a mnemonic that's already established. But the example that we will give you today is of uh, the Rentitz song, the male Rentitz song, sounding like it's the rhythm and pattern of a bouncing ball. Now this is a rentit, which is a very secretive bird that's found in our area a lot out by the coast, like in the coastal scrub, uh, you know, buried deep in coyote brush. And they're often quite hard to see, but uh, this particular bird, the, the, the male rentit sings all year round. So you can hear it when you're out at Cordum Trail or out in Jenner or Bodega Bay. So before I play the sound, I wanna point out that this right here is what's called a spectrogram or um, also called a sonogram. And it's basically just a visual representation of the sound. And so um, here, you know, it's roughly straight across. It goes down slightly. And that's kind of showing you that the pitch is gonna be the same. So follow along visually to this spectrogram as I play the actual sound. It, it's actually corresponded to the, the specific recording I'm about to play. So keep your ear out next time you're out at the coast. You, you might actually hear this and, and know that you're listening to a rent in that bush somewhere. Okay, so now we're, there's a ton of resources out there um, that will help you learn uh, bird watching skills, both online and books. And so we just wanted to give you some of our favorite ways to keep learning. So our biggest tip is sim uh, all similar to learning vocalizations is to get to know your common birds, starting with the birds you see on a daily basis, that repetition that you build up um, really helps you build a familiarity with the birds. Um, to attract more birds to your yard, adding native plants is a huge plus. Um, if you do have a bird feeder or a bird bath, that's a great way to bring birds in closer. Just make sure you keep those very clean. Um, but really the key to improving your overall bird identification skills is developing a solid, solid foundation of the common birds. And that way when a, when a bird pops up that does look unfamiliar, it'll kind of stick out like a sore thumb. So it actually will help you uh, see uncommon birds is getting to know your common birds. And we are really big fans of our local library. Um, you know, this right here, this is just six of our favorite bird related books. And it actually includes the Sibley Birds West, this one on the right, which is the field guide that we happen to like. It has a different cover than what we showed because it's a newer edition, but, um, <coughs> excuse me. We happen to know that the Sonoma County Regional Library has each of these six books for, for rent. So um, use your library liberally and check out different field guides to see what you might like before you even commit to, to purchasing one if you're interested in one. But the biggest shortcut to improving your bird identification skills is to go out with more experienced birders. So getting out on a field trip with a local bird club is a great way. Um, you know, obviously right now during the pandemic, those aren't happening, um, but keep in touch with your, uh, you know, Madrone Audubon Society here in Sonoma County, Redwood Region Ornithological Society also. Down in Marin County, they have an Audubon Society. And the Feminist Bird Club is a nationwide organization that has a San Francisco Bay Area chapter. And they're really focused on inclusivity and providing a safe place for underrepresented groups to safely access nature. And then online, um, these days there is an overwhelming amount of information related to birds and bird watching out there. Um, so we just want to suggest that a great one-stop shop where you can find any kind of information you're looking for is the resources offered by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So first off, eBird is a fantastic app for your phone and it also has a corresponding website and um, it has a lot of features, but uh, one simple feature is that it allows you to track your own bird sightings. So if keeping a life list is something that you're interested in, um, certainly you don't 
have to be to, in order to enjoy birds, but, but it is an easy way to keep a list of what you've seen. And it also allows you to share that data of your own sightings with Cornell Lab uh, as part of their massive citizen science project. And they get to use that data for all kinds of research uh, related to birds and bird distribution, migration, and how climate change is affecting birds. Um, so it's, it's kind of nice to, to participate for those reasons as well. Uh, over here, Macaulay Library is simply the media database that's attached to eBird. So all the photographs, audio recordings, um, videos that people submit get plopped into the Macaulay Library. And it is also a really fantastic learning resource. We have learned so much simply by looking up a particular species and seeing other people's um, photographs all across the, the range of where that bird is. Um, same thing for audio recordings. It's just really helpful. You can also um, narrow it down by location or date or, um, you know, you could plug in Sonoma County, for example, and also see all of the photographs uploaded recently. So you can kind of get an idea of what birds are in the area. And then um, allaboutbirds.org is essentially Cornell Lab's um, online field guide. So it is showing pretty much all of the birds you can expect to see in North America and gives really detailed uh, bird profiles and life histories and also really great identification tips. Uh, it also will compare a particular species to other similar looking species and then give you tips to distinguish the two. So it's um, essentially the, the same thing that you would get in a, a field guide book, but online. Okay, so now the last part of our presentation is the practice part. Um, so how to look at birds. Uh, we're going to share just four photographs of birds that found in Sonoma County. And we're gonna look at them like we've you know, never seen them before. They're totally unfamiliar. And we're gonna kind of go through systematically on how we would try to identify these birds in a field guide. So let's get started. All right, first up, we put the first bird in silhouette just to, um, further kind of uh, show the importance of looking at the shape and posture of a bird. So what am I noticing? First of all, I'm noticing that there are blades of grass over here. So I'm thinking that this bird is somewhere down near the ground and that this appears to be some kind of tangled root system. Then I wanna look at the bill. So um, I do see that it's carrying something in its bill. So part of the bill might be obscured in the silhouette, but it does not look very wide where it's connecting to the face here. And it looks like it could be kind of long. So it kind of seems like a longer, skinny, maybe it comes to a point, so maybe a little sharper type bill. And then size, of course, size is hard to gauge from a photograph, but um, you know, compared to the grass blades over here, it's a pretty small bird. So I'm gonna probably guess that it's a sparrow sized or maybe a little smaller. And then the biggest thing that sticks out to me is that the tail is kind of sticking up a bit. You know, it's not hanging down towards the ground, but the, the bird is like upright, but the tail is also upright. So let's add the color to it. Okay, so now um, I'm noticing that generally it's, it's brown on the back with a brown tail and then the front of it, the breast and the belly are more of like a dusky brown gray. And then I'm seeing these uh, stripes on the tail. And this would probably be considered barring because it's uh, going horizontally across the tail. And then the biggest thing that sticks out is this uh, eyebrow. So remember the eyebrow is a line of feathers right above the eye. And it's interesting how long it is. It goes all the way from the bill to about where the neck goes. So um, I do remember even earlier in the presentation, we read the family account of wrens. And I remember that wrens are generally brown. They're found near the ground, press angled above their backs. So I'm going to use that knowledge to start um, looking in the wren section. And keep in mind, you know, you might not always get the family right, but it at the very least gives you a place to start looking. So I start flipping through the wren section and I do actually see a couple of different species that show a bit of a white eyebrow, but only one of them shows one that is this long and this sort of bright high contrast white. 
and that's the Buick's Wren. So um, it looks pretty similar to this guy down here. Uh, this illustration is showing a little bit more reddish brown, but, but that's okay. You know, that just goes to show that there's a lot of variation between specific uh, individuals. So don't get tripped up by the color not exactly, exactly matching the field guide. And then, of course, I want to check the range map. So down here, um, I know in this book that purple stands for year round. So over here in California, the Buick's rent is year round and it's expected to be here. So I feel pretty confident about this being a Buick's rent. Okay, on to the next bird. So first off, I'm seeing a bird on the sandy beach with the water behind it. And then I'm gonna look at the bill, of course. So I'm seeing a long down curved bill. It's really got a big curve at the end. So. Um, I'm actually not too far away from this bird when we took this photo, so um, I could kind of gauge that it was about crow size. Um, field marks. So the biggest field mark I'm seeing is this brown head striping. It's kind of brown line, eye stripe through the eye and then brown on the crown creates this brown head striping. And then the rest of the body is just kind of a speckled brown of different shades, a little darker on the back, a little lighter on the belly. And then I'm seeing, you know, these long gray legs. So when I take into consideration the location, that long bill and the, the long legs, I'm thinking, this is probably one of those shorebirds. So I flip to the shorebird section and I start, I'm going to key in on that bill. I'm going to see if I can see any shorebirds with that long down curved bill. And I do see uh, a few different shorebirds with this long down curved bill, but um, I only see in a couple with this brown head striping here. And then when I check the, the um, range map, I only see one that corresponds with the time of the year, which is winter, that I should be seeing this bird in Sonoma County. And this is the Wimbrel. So I'm seeing that brown head striping here. Um, and you probably can't really see it here, but it's um, on coastal California, it's shaded blue. So it's expected here in the winter. So I'm thinking we're looking at a Wimbrel here. Oh my, look at this <laughs> bright bird. Okay, so first things first, it's on a branch and I see a leaf behind it. So that's gonna give me an idea of size, uh, that this bird is likely pretty small. So um, it might be sparrow size, it might be even smaller than that, I, I really don't know. And then if I look at the bill, um, it's rather small, you know, not very wide at all where it meets the face, not very big compared to the head. And it kind of comes to a point, and I'm reminded of that tweezer type bill we talked about earlier for warblers. Then field marks, um, it's got a bright yellow face. Uh, that yellow goes all the way down the breast about halfway. And then I see a uh, black on top of the head. So this is called the crown of the head. And I see black on the throat and then black, uh, this black face pattern. It almost kind of looks like a mask on the face. And then I see thick black streaks on the side of the body here, which is the, the flank area. And then um, the belly underneath looks white, and so does the underneath of the tail. And then I notice it has uh, black, um, you know, dark wings with two bright white wing bars right here. And so if I think about that tweezery type bill, and uh, I also, because I've, I've familiarized myself with, with the field guide and families, I also know that um, warblers in general tend to be fairly colorful, uh, specifically with the color yellow. So I'm thinking, well, let's, that's a good place to start. Let's flip through the warblers. And I find a couple of species that actually have this black sort of face pattern on yellow. And unfortunately they are very, very, very similar looking, and I don't know how to tell them apart. But if I start looking at the range map, I realize that there is only one that's even expected to be in the area here in wintertime, which is when we took this photo. So I feel pretty confident that this is a Townsend's Warbler. All right, last one. So let's see, what am I noticing on this bird? Well, first off, it looks like it's on the ground and out in the open. Um, I'm going to zero in on the bill and I see that it's got that kind of triangular bill that's uh, thicker at the base where it meets the base and going into a point, create a triangle shape. Um, I'm feeling like it's about sparrow size-ish, so we'll see how that fits in. Um, onto the field marks. So I'm seeing a black and white head striping 
I'm definitely noting that. I'm noticing a bright white throat underneath the bill on the bird. And then I'm also noticing that yellow spot on the face. So the yellow kind of above and in front of the eye. I'm also noticing that the chest is clean. There's not any streaking on the chest here. It looks just pretty clean gray, kind of going into brown on the side here. Um, the wings, I see brown wings with two small white kind of almost wing bars here. And so I'm gonna put some of these uh, clues together to try to figure out what family of birds. So first off, it's out on the ground in the open with that triangular bill. So I'm thinking that, and the size fits for a sparrow. So I'm thinking we're maybe are looking at a sparrow. So I flip to the sparrow section and I'm gonna key in on that black and white head striping. And I see several birds that have that black and white head striping, but only one that has this yellow patch above and in front of the eye combined with this bright white throat here. And what we're looking at is a white throated sparrow. And this photo was, was taken in, I believe, December. And so I see on the range map that it's blue on the west coast during winter time. So we can be pretty confident we're looking at a white throated sparrow. All right, that pretty much wraps up our presentation portion. And thank you all for sticking with us this far. Um, we're gonna stop sharing our screen and kick it back over to Allison for uh, a few chat questions, I think. So um, let me just stop sharing the screen. Wow, well, thank you both so much. There is so much appreciation for you in the chat. I can give you a round of applause. <laughs> I know that it's so funny to give a talk when you can't see your audience, but <laughs> there, there is just, I mean, tons of comments in the chat coming in right now. Thank you for so much great information. Um, we have just a few minutes left. So I was going to pose a couple questions to you that I think would be applicable to our audience, even though our audience includes folks from both coasts, from across the United States and beyond. Um, and then I do have like one question that might be more pertinent to local folks in Sonoma County. Um, so the first question I have is, are there any specific markings or traits that are particularly helpful for identifying sparrows? Sparrows, um, I would say in general, um, what if you can get a look at the front of the bird, uh, whether the breast has streaking or is plain is a good way to kind of break it up into two categories. There's always variation, especially if um, you're looking at a bird during the summer, because young sparrows, even when they grow up and they don't have any uh, markings on their breast, they will have some streaking, so it can get a little tricky, but that, that is a really good place to start. And then in general, the face pattern. If you can get a look at the crown, the stripings on the crown, um, any lines through the eyes, those are the two ones that come to my mind. Yeah, uh, one more, a little more sort of subtle thing to notice is the tail length. And mm. that can be kind of hard, but you know, if you can sort of measure the tail uh, compared to the body, certain sparrows have pretty stubby tails like the savanna sparrow and certain sparrows like the song sparrow has a pretty long tail. But that's, but that's getting a little more subtle. So if, if you can add that third piece on also, that would be helpful. Great, thank you. And just still so much chiming in, appreciation coming in in the chat. Um, the other question that I think would be applicable to our entire audience is about, let's see, about photography. Do you have any suggestions on photographing birds, even perhaps like lens length? Um, do you use the camera with your binoculars? And could you talk just a little bit about how to record audio of bird sounds? Well, Teresa is the, the resident photographer, so I'll let her take that. Yeah, on. so um, we, we do not consider ourselves like wildlife photographers. We, we, we think of ourselves as, you know, bird enthusiasts that like to take photos because it's really helpful to take a photo and go back home and and learn something about the bird because you know sometimes you only get a, a second to look at a bird or a handful of seconds but um the camera we use is a, a digital camera uh that is a an older canon rebel it's a canon t2i and it's an older model but it's really served us well and um we we have not yet graduated up to like a super long lens but we use a lens that is 55 millimeters to 250 and it's really lightweight. It's really inexpensive. 
um, compared to the other lens. You know, once you go up to 400 millimeters or, or higher, I mean, these lenses can get up to $1,500, $2,000 easily. And so we, we just have never graduated to that. So this is what we use. And this is as big as our lens goes. And for us personally, we found that um, with being patient and being quiet and taking advantage of opportunities to take, care, take pictures of birds that we've gotten plenty of bird photos. Um, I know that there are other cameras, if you're not ready to buy this kind of a camera with an attachable lens, there are, um, I think they're called bridge cameras that have some sort of zoom lens built in. And I think that um, that's also a pretty good camera for starting out with birding. And then um, we're really bad at it, but a lot of people have the attachment that you put onto uh, your binoculars to attach your, your iPhone or your, your smartphone. Um, we just have never really gotten good at that, but I know that a lot of people are really successful with that. So um, I think that's also worth exploring. Yeah. As far as audio recording, um, I know that uh, smartphones um, can, can provide totally decent enough audio recordings to at least listen back and try to learn from. Uh, we have a, just a little handheld recorder um, that is, is really small. It can just fit into my pocket and uh, it's an Olympus LS11 is what our, ours is. And um, the, it's kind of the same thing there. We're kind of opportunistic. We don't really go out hunting to get recordings or photographs, but when an opportunity arises, you know, a bird singing right in front of us, we'll just try to stay really still and quiet. And I will say that recording birds has really added a lot to our bird watching because it, it really forces us to stay still and quiet for longer than maybe we would have if we just are interested in identifying it and moving on. So if you're interested in learning bird vocalizations, recording birds is a really great way to kind of, kind of speed up the learning curve. Great, thank you. That is really helpful. Um, so I just have a couple, I know we're a little over time. I have a couple questions now that are, are a little bit more local. Um, so if folks want to hang in there, I, there was a couple questions that came in about the Dunlin. Um, there was a question about, is the change in plumage colorful bo for both the males and females and do they molt and what kind of molt? And there was also a question, um, do we see them here in their breeding plumage um, in Sonoma County? So um, I'll answer the second question first. Um, we generally don't see them in breeding plumage here. Uh, well, the bulk of the time that they spend generally in the county is over winter, but they do start to molt um, sort of in early spring. So the, the picture that we included in our presentation was from May, and I think that we took that at Bodega Bay. So. Uh, as they start to transition their plumage and molt into their breeding plumage, uh, then uh, most of them will fly north to, to go breed north of here. Um, not every single one, I think, technically leaves. I think that sometimes, I don't know specifically for the Dunlin, but I know for some shorebirds, um, for example, like sometimes first year birds don't end up migrating that, during that first year to go breed. Um, but it is possible. So the short answer is it is possible to see the Dunlin in breeding plumage in the county. If you start looking around April, I'd say April or early May, you might get a chance to, to see them once they've transitioned, but before they've left. And as far as the plumage goes, uh, I believe the males and females will look the same. I think there's just very small differences in like bill length that can tell a male and a female apart. But as far as plumage patterns goes, they're, they're identical. Great. Okay. One other quick question. Um, Before you say that, I, I did want to say that um, if you go to our website and con find our contact information there, if you have questions that don't get answered here, just e shoot us an email. We're happy to that way. I just want to say that. Great. Thank you so much. That's a really sweet offer. I'll be sure to include a link to your website on the follow-up email as well. And the recording will be in that email. So keep an eye out for that. That should be coming later on this afternoon and it'll be from Eventbrite. So if you had trouble accessing the webinar, try marking Eventbrite as a safe sender. Sometimes those emails can go to your spam. So all of that great information will be in that follow-up email. And one more question was in that slide, 
the when to look at bird slide early in the presentation, there's a photograph of a picnic table and a beautiful vista. Oh. <laughs> Where is that? <laughs> oh yeah, it, it is on the um, Shell Beach Trail or the Pobo Canyon Trail. So if you mm -hmm. start um, along the coast, if you were just north of the town of Jenner, there- Just south. Just, uh, yeah. It's, uh, I think that Shell Beach is a particular um, beach spot right there. And if you park somewhere on the ocean side, there's there's an actual parking lot that you can park at that goes down to the beach. But if you park there and then, you know, just be really careful when you cross Highway 1. But right across the street there, across Highway 1, is a trailhead. And that goes up towards uh, Pomo Canyon Campground you can get to and Red Hill. Um, so I don't know exactly what the trail is called. It might be Pomo Canyon Trail or it might be Shell Beach Trail. Uh, but somewhere along the way on the first portion of the ascent, um, if you keep your eye open on the left side, there is like a tiny side trail um, that leads to that picnic table. And you can, you can see it there and you get a really wonderful view of the estuary and the ocean and the hills and everything. It's, it's fantastic. So I thought that was a West County shot. That was a beautiful, beautiful yeah. photo, but I wasn't sure. So the last couple questions here are just about how can people, you know, you do walks all over Sonoma County for all kinds of different nonprofits and groups. Um, can people look at your website to see what's coming up? And do you ever do like private bird watching tours? And how can people contact you about that? Um, yes and yes. Our website will have that information. We have a little bird walks page. Um, right now, during the pandemic, obviously, um, pretty much all of the in-person stuff has been shut down. Um, but we are happy to take people out on personalized walks or small group walks. We love doing that. Um, and then also with various nonprofits with the Laguna Foundation, hopefully we can uh, take a group out sometime this spring, maybe. Um, but yeah, we, we do periodically give either large group walks to the public um, or private walks just through contacting us through our website. And we're happy to do that. We really, we really enjoy that. As much as we yeah. love giving presentations over the computer, we, are, we really love being out in the field with, with everybody. Yes, we all miss getting to go out and share these experiences <laughs> together in nature. But in the meantime, this was so helpful. Thank you okay. both so much. And thank you to our audience for being here today. Um, we really appreciate your support of our organization and your enthusiasm for birds. Um, it means a lot to us to know that there's so many of you out there who care and that there's so many spread across the U.S. Mm -hmm. and beyond who are invested in this series, Birding to Beat the Winter Blues. If you are interested in the upcoming events, they are still open for registration and that will be included in the follow-up email as well. You can also check out the Laguna Foundation's community education page for more virtual events this spring and hopefully sometime in-person events this year, um, getting out and enjoying the nature of the Laguna. Thank you all so much and I look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thank you, everybody. We had such a great time. Thank you, Allison, and to the Laguna Foundation. Um, we just we just love doing this kind of stuff, and we're really grateful for everybody tuning in today. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.